1947 begins a cultural revolution, a rolling cultural revolution. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. After the US midterm elections, the battle for the future of the Republican Party continues. To discuss the intellectual case for Trumpism, I'm joined by the Israeli philosopher Yoram Hazoni, whose new book, Conservatism, A Rediscovery, explores the past, present and future of conservatism. Thank you so much, Yoram, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. What is national conservatism? You probably remember uh, that after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was this, this period, which people have called it you know, the, the end of history, a period of 25 years or so in which all of the major political parties in the UK, in America, in, uh, in Europe, um, became attached to a vision of um, a single world order. People call it liberal internationalism or, uh, or the rules-based international order. And the, the, the idea was we basically know, on the basis of our knowledge of liberalism, we basically know what we need for human, human societies to flourish, for countries to flourish. And that's basically you give people their individual liberties, you give them equality, you, 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 uh, you don't impose moral or political obligations except on the basis of consent. And the idea was if you could do that worldwide, you would maximize your human flourishing. So the, the, the problem with this is that it was kind of a ut utopian scheme and uh, left out all sorts of parts of, uh, of human nature. And what we got to see with Brexit in 2016 and, uh, and then immediately thereafter with uh, the, the, the Trump presidency, you know, as, as well as other similar phenomena, you know, uh, Maloney in Italy and so on, what we got to see is a, a reaction uh, by uh, large numbers of people, large numbers of voters and citizens who felt that something important was being taken away from them by having the authority of their governments, the, you know, the, the traditional governments that ruled over uh, wherever they lived, uh, having it sent someplace else, you know, to, to Brussels or to the United Nations or wherever the World Trade Organization sits. So by the time that we get to uh, 2016, we're clearly moving into uh, an age where there is uh, uh, th th there are various reactions to this globalism, to this liberal internationalism, to this idea of one global order. And um, national conservatism, I mean, the fundamental idea is that the parliament, the, the, the British parliament, is uh, the highest instantiation of uh, uh, legitimate political power in the UK. And uh, the fact that somebody in Brussels or Germany or elsewhere or in Washington wants things to be different, well, that's not the way that the world is best ordered. So that's, in a, in a nutshell, that's national conservatism. It's the, uh, the, 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 the attempt to create a, a political theory and a political movement um, that will uh, be strong enough and intelligent enough, right enough to be able to, uh, to roll, roll back globalism. So can you just give viewers a vague idea of where these, this Anglo-American conservative tradition has come from? Sure. Um, I, I should just say so something quickly about, about Burke, that there's a, um, there's a sort of a standard way of, of looking at conservatism and saying, well, it begins, it begins with Burke. But if you start reading Burke, you see that Burke doesn't think that he's founding conservatism. He, he, he starts naming all of these earlier figures from previous centuries. And the, 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 the reason that, uh, that people like to say that it starts with Burke is because they want to say, well, look, liberalism was, was doing just great. And Burke uh, saw the French Revolution. He decided to repair liberalism. And I, I think that this view is... Um, uh, it's it, it's ten it's tendentious. It's a it's a a view that tries to make liberalism um, uh, even even more than it was at the time. And in order to 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 make this this argument clear, I um, I went back. I I, I should say I, uh, this research, uh, the historical research about England, I did together with my my good friend, uh, Dr. Ophir Haivri, 
who is, uh, he's an expert on the, you know, the history and the political theory of the common lawyers. And um, you, you can, you know, you can take this all the way back to Alfred, but, but I thought it would be reasonable to start um, for this book to start in the place where you can see conservatism clearly in a way that is familiar to us. So that, that, that's after the Wars of the Ro Roses. Uh, John Fortescue was, was uh, uh, the, the chief justice and candidate to be the, the, the chancellor. He's in exile in France. And he, he wrote a book called In Praise of the Laws of England. And you, you can, this is a small book and you can get it today. There's a, there's a new Cambridge University uh, edition uh, where they've cleaned up the spelling. It's, it's just a breeze. It's easy to read. There's no, you know, every, every, every Englishman, every American should, should read it. And um, what's remarkable is that, um, that the book is written in the 1470s. Nevertheless, Fortescue is describing uh, things that are completely familiar to us from the Anglo-American Constitution. So there, there, there's the, uh, the separation of powers between the king and parliament and the bicameral legislature and, uh, and, and the, the responsibilities of the legislature and taxation and, and uh, legislation. Uh, and, 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 and beyond this, you know, beyond institutions that are familiar, he defends, spends a lot of time defending the jury trial and uh, the executive veto. But, you know, I think one of the things that's most remarkable about this uh, is the emphasis that he places on the sanctity of property. And uh, he argues that the, the reason that, uh, that uh, England is superior to Germany or France or anything else that's known on the continent is because the English king um, can't, d doesn't have the right to enter the home of, you know, e even, even the, the, the poorest farmer without his permission, much less to take something. And, uh, and so here, here we are in the, you know, in the 1470s, 300 years before Montesquieu, and we're reading, you know, many of the same ideas that we immediately recognize, oh, that's the Anglo-American tradition, except it turns out that it, it's not a product of the rationalist enlightenment. It's, it's a product of a, uh, uh, of a long history uh, of uh, uh, religious thinkers, Christian thinkers. There's, there's a, a, a Bible at the basis of, of, of this as you read Fortescue. And um, I, I think that when, when you go back to Fortescue or other thinkers that I discuss, Hooker and Selden and, and, and uh, Hale and so on, I, you suddenly get the feeling that, you know, no, this isn't, you know, the, the things that are most important to us are not things that were, you know, invented through, through you know, cogitation, pure reason in the 1700s. The, the opposite. They, they are the, the unique, unique gift of the English people and later the English speaking peoples, that, 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 that things that are inherited by their, by their traditions, by our traditions. And um, th I think that puts a completely different spin on it because th that already starts to address the question, what would you have to do in order for, for these things to survive? Well, the, the first thing you'd have to do is you'd have to stop saying that, that, that it's pure reason, that you know, anybody could figure this out. You know, if, if you just sit and think about it, then you could just, you know, come to all of these rights and it would be obvious, but it, it's not true at all. You, you need the, the many centuries of trial and error uh, that at fir first the English and later Americans and others contributed to. It's interesting you talked about the end of history in the 1990s, and I think to many, the beginning of history is in the Enlightenment, and they see it as this kind of, you know, all of human progress today comes back from that period and that period alone and it starts, as you say, through these kind of rationalist thinkers. Now there are three revolutions I want you to talk about um, in relation to all of this stuff. So the first is in 1688, the second in 1776, and the final one in 1789 in France. So there's the English, American and French revolutions. And how do those revolutions impact us today in conservatism yeah. and liberalism? Well, the, the French Revolution is is the easiest because um, you know I, when you meet people when, when you talk to political theorists on you know on the continent uh, French or Germans or otherwise um, they often say that uh, that the American Revolution and the Glorious Revolution in Britain uh, um, 
in England were were um, were not real revolutions. That the uh, the breakthrough to, to liberalism really happens in the French Revolution because it's in the French Revolution that you 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 have the the declaration the, the of uh, the the declaration the Universal Decla Declaration of the Rights of Man, where they the, they start to make lists of all of the uh, all of the liberties and equalities that that people have, and that that list making really begins with the French Revolution and continues to this day. People continue to to make these lists and to keep at, adding to them, and. Um, so the French Revolution is um, clearly and unequivocally, uh, it, 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 its, uh, it, its leadership uh, took from, uh, from Rousseau what I'm calling uh, Enlightenment rationalism, meaning that you, you, you don't need trial and error, you don't need tradition, you, don't, you, know, you certainly don't need the Bible, you don't need religion. None of these things are necessary. All you need is to think clearly. And if people start to think clearly, then they have the answer. And the the the, the assumption is that there is one correct answer. Th that's the same assumption that you know that George H. W. Bush, when he starts talking about the New World Order after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's the same assumption that that there's only one right answer, and it's obvious if you think about it. Um, and it applies to people equally within France and in China and right, within wherever. Right. It applies. Um, a, I mean, I find this astonishing, but apparently many people uh, believe this, that, there, that there, there is one correct, Rousseau will say, uh, there's one correct constitution, and, uh, and it applies to all nations and all periods of history, going back to the very beginning and all the way into the future. And Rousseau says, if you deviate even slightly from the, the one true constitution, then your government's not legitimate. And that, there you see that you know, it, it, it's immediately the basis for a, an extremely uh, aggressive and violent way of thinking about the world because if you think that, you know, that, that what you're doing constitutionally and legally and morally in your country, that it's true for all other countries, it's a very small step to, to start saying, all right, well, anybody who wants to rise up against you know, the, the, uh, um, the, the unjust rulers of all other countries on earth, we're happy to support us, and that's an actual that's an actual event that took place during the French Revolution. Is the is is the the, the issuance of these kinds of edicts. And just very briefly, yeah, sticking on the Please. French Revolution sure. before we get on to the other ones, it's, the reason Burke is so remarked upon by many conservatives is because of obviously he wrote his fantastic book, Reflections on the Revolution in France, where he, bas he basically predicted the terror that was to come. Right. And I think it's it's important commenting on that terror that happened in France because again. Many people don't necessarily know this history, so it's good to explain it. But you know, th there was a, a massive amount of bloodshed in Paris from the guillotine and all of these um, the, these terrible things that, as as a result of this revolution, that people still laud today as being this great, fantastic moment in history. Yeah, no, it's it, it's very difficult for me to see it as a fantastic moment in history. I mean, it, uh, you, you're right that it it uh, uh, it, it begins with um, uh, with the declaration of the uh, the equality and the rights of people, and proceeds uh, directly, you know, much, very much in the spirit of Rousseau, proceeds directly to uh, to the you know the the, uh, the mass execution of, of 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 nobles and then the royal family, uh, and uh, the expro expropriation of uh, of uh, uh, of the Catholic Church, and uh, and moves from there to. Uh, you know, to genocide, to to the you know the the, the killing of of a hundred thousand people in the Vendée because because th that region is still loyal to to the king, and from there, um, Napoleon uh, takes charge of the thing after uh, after a, a few years of chaos, and then he takes this idea of well, we've got the answer, we know the universal answer, we know the universal constitution, and and so he just says let's. You know, let's go. We'll, we'll, we'll topple governments all the way across Europe, and and, and millions died. And uh, this this kind of um, fanaticism that says, uh, "I have the answer," and uh, and and I'm the liberator. I'm the chosen liberator. I'm 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 simply going to topple all the regimes, and then impose laws 
according to this universal pattern. And if you read Napoleon's biography, then you, you'll, you'll, you'll see this is just what he does, is that he, he writes a constitution. He, he writes new laws for, for the Dutch, and he writes new laws for the Spanish, and he writes new laws for the Italian. He, he himself, he and his, his, his close lawyer friend, they know all of the answers for all, all of the peoples. And uh, so I, I, I think that, um, that to understand um, Burke's reaction, I think, and, and, and by the way, the, also to understand the reaction of uh, Americans like, uh, like Washington and Hamilton and John Jay and uh, um, uh, John Adams, um, uh, Anglo Anglophiles uh, in the American founding, to understand the reactions of all of these, uh, uh, the, these important historical figures to the French Revolution, you have to understand that they were primarily worried not about what was happening in France, but about what could happen in Britain and the United States. So th this is, th this is um, even, even before Burke's famous book on, on the French Revolution, um, John Adams uh, wrote a, th uh, a three-volume book called In, in Defense, in defense of, of, uh, the, uh, in defense of the American Constitutions. And there are the, his argument in the book is that, that the British Constitution actually is the best constitution that there's ever been. So it's in, you know, it's in the spirit of Fortescue, uh, saying, look, if you compare, you know, if you compare England to, to, to the rest of Europe and certainly the rest of the world, this is the best constitution that anyone has ever, ever come up with. But he, he then argues that the strength of 150 years of, uh, of American experience before 1776 with, with uh, writing constitutions, the, the, the constitutions in the American col colonies were always based on the English constitution. Now, it's true that, that, uh, that there, there's no ar aristocracy in America and no king ever set foot in, in, in America. So it's a, it's a kind of a republicanized uh, English tradition, but he, he makes the comparison. He says, the strength of America's constitutions is that they are derived and adjusted for our, our uh, benefit here, but, but they are the English constitution. They're the continuation of the English constitutional tradition. And um, in, so Burke and Adams, who are, who are they arguing against? They're not arguing with Robespierre. Burke is arguing with people like, uh, like uh, um, uh, uh, Richard Price and, uh, and then Charles James Fox and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, Tom Paine. These are people who accept the theory of the French Revolution and Jefferson is, is you know, not only did Jefferson, was Jefferson in France you know, helping cook this up and, and so, was, so was Paine, but it, Jefferson is, uh, you know, is writing letters saying, I, 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 I can't, uh, I look forward to the day when I can visit England together with Pichigru, with the, with, with, with the, with the conquering triumphant revolutionary armies. I, I mean, he's basically saying, you know, like the same way that they, that they executed the king in, in France, they'll do it in England too. And I can't wait to be in England to, you know, to, to, to see the whole thing overthrown, just like in France. And so the, the, the debate that breaks out in, in America is, 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 a, is very similar to this debate in England, is not, you know, do, uh, it, it, is what's happening in France something that we should like or not, so much as this is coming here. There are people arguing for this here. There are people giving, you know, standing in public and arguing he, here, here, here in the UK, here in, America, arguing that the same thing should happen. And the, the, uh, the conservatives, the traditionalists in America, they're called the Federalist Party. Uh, in, in England, they, they become the conservative party, although that name is a little bit, it, 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 it's coined a little bit after Burke. And, uh, and, and their view is this view that says, no, there, there is no one, there's no one answer that, 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 you know, that Jefferson or, 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 uh, or, or Price or Fox can come up with that, that, that's right for everyone or Napoleon. Each, we have our traditions and our traditions carry the results, good and bad, of 
many centuries, thousands of years in fact, of experiments to see what works and what doesn't work. And when you overthrow that, you, you, uh, you, complete, you, you lose what young people today call the guardrails, the, 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 the common sense. The, com, a com, the common sense is a tradition. It's a, it's a common sense that you learn when you're growing up of, of where are the borders? How far can you, you push your rights before you have to stop and say, look, that's, that's already too far. That'll, that'll destroy things. Now, I do want to come back to these other revolutions that I mentioned because many people might assume that as being a conservative, you'd be a, you're, you know, you're an anti-revolutionary. However, there are two revolutions that I think maybe are, are sort of the, you know, one's known as the glorious revolution in itself. So that gives you a hint as to how people view it today. Although, having said that, in yeah. 1688, so essentially James II was invited off the throne by Parliament. Right. William of Orange came in. Um, and, and became king, and he was invited by, by Parliament to do that. Yeah. And there are two issues to discuss about this revolution, and the first is the, the religion, so this was about Catholicism versus yep. Protestantism, and it was about royal absolutism. And yes. both of these things are still controversial today, I would say. You know, Catholics yeah. today might argue that James II, you know, he wasn't an absolutist, and, 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 and there's, you know, in your book you very much uh, disagree with that. So can you talk about that revolution and how important that was for the for the second one, almost, almost 100 years later, in the United States. Sure. Um, Burke, Burke wrote, uh, wrote another book that uh, almost immediately after Reflections on the Revolution in France. It, it's called uh, 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 appeal, from the, appeal, from the new, uh, appeal from the New Whigs to the Old. And he's, he's struggling with the fact, he, he obviously was, was uh, uh, politically a Whig. He was one of the uh, the, the founders of the, the f first to the modern Whig party and then later of the modern Tory party. But uh, as, a, as a Whig, he, he, he followed this tradition of uh, Fortescue and, uh, and Selden and Hale and, and, and Blackstone. And uh, his view, uh, l very much like that, the, the rest of that tradition going s centuries back, um, is that, uh, that the English constitution is a is a balanced constitution. It's a finely tuned balancing of all sorts of different forces, and that it, it cannot. Even though it's true that Fortescue says, and Burke would agree, that the English are the freest people in in the world, Burke would agree with that. But he thinks that the source of these freedoms is in 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 the balancing of all these different powers and and um, powers, conventions, traditions, which. Um, uh, obviously run down periodically. I mean, a anyone looking at English history or, or really any, any history over a long period, we, we know that human constitutions run down, they decay. And that means that they periodically need to be repaired, they need to be restored. Um, and so, so the, the, uh, what, what makes Burke a, a Whig is that he doesn't think that the correct answer is whatever the king chooses, um, is what is what should be, okay? Which which is as as you mentioned that that was part of the struggle between uh, uh, between Parliament and the Stuarts was this this issue. James the first writes a book four years before becoming King of England when he's King of Scotland, and uh, and the book is about uh, the fact that all the laws are the gift of the king. That's a, uh, uh, the the book is called the royal. Royal gift, Basilicon Doron, and his argument, and he, he's no slouch intellectually, but his argument is that whatever there is, is flows from 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 the king, and the uh, uh, the English common lawyers cannot accept this. They they think that what whatever is and whatever works, is an inherited set of traditions. That's how you know who is the king. That's how you know, you know what, what the proper balance is among the different parts of government. Now, th they all agree that you can't simply, I mean, Selden is very, very clear, clear on this, and so is Burke. You, you can't simply just say, you know, whatever traditions we've inherited, <coughs> we're, we're going to take them as, as we get them. Because, because we understand that, that living things, they, they rise and they fall. That there's a decline, and then there needs to be a repair. And, um, the for for Burke when he's writing about you know what today what is called the Glorious Revolution, um, 
he's, he's thinking about the, the, using the term revolution in the old sense, something that spins around and then it comes back to where it used to be. Today, the word, I think, the word we would naturally use is a restoration, that the, uh, the Glorious Revolution, Burke argues that, that it's a restoration. It's a restoration of the, uh, the English Constitution, both in terms of the, the, the proper balance between uh, uh, the, the king and, and the parliament, and, and, and also in, in terms of the independence of, uh, of uh, the, the English church from, you know, from, from uh, the, the aspirations to universal Catholicism uh, of the pope. Um, the, the American Revolution is also very similar in that sense. It, now, it's true that uh, Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and that some of the phrases in the Declaration of Independence sound like things that, you know, that, that, uh, that Burke and later the Federalists would be uncomfortable with. But the, 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 uh, the decision to break with, uh, with Britain is couched in terms, first and foremost, of the violation of traditional Eng English liberties. The, in other words, it's modeled directly on the Glorious Revolution. The claim is what we're trying to do is to restore the, uh, the ancient legal inheritance, the rights that we've inherited as Englishmen. Now, what's interesting about the American Revolution is that it, it, it actually has two phases. There's the part that begins in 1776, and there's the part that begins in 1787 with the writing of a second American Constitution. People forget that 1777, there, there is an American Constitution, and that Constitution is built, it, it's kind of a preview of, um, of the, the Constitution, the political theories in the French Revolution. It, it, has, a, uh, it, it has one branch of government, a, uh, a National Assembly, and all the powers are in that branch of government. Uh, the the, the, the le legislative power and the executive power, everything is, is, uh, it, it, it is supposed to flow from this big committee of representatives. We get to see this later in, uh, in the new Constitution of Pennsylvania, which is a disaster, and then later in the constitutions, one after another of the French Revolution. And what, what, what happens is that this rationalist Constitution of 1777, well, it turns out that, that, that it doesn't work. I mean, it, you know, mathematically it works. It works in somebody's mind, but it doesn't actually work. And the, the, uh, you know, if you grow up in the United States, the, the, the story of the war, as you're taught it, is, you know, is of, of, of uh, um, uh, the United States not being able to raise armies. If they raise them, they can't pay for them. They, they, they don't have money. Washington is 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 literally watching his 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 men die of starvation during the war, and Washington and his officers, and 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 uh, and, and, and other friends and allies, uh, businessmen who are you know writing checks to help you know they're basically running the American Re Revolution with donations of private individuals, wealthy individuals, because because they have no way of raising the taxes, and Washington, um, and. It, in this sense, you know, at least as much as, you know, in, in, in terms of his generalship, Washington very early on in the war begins circulating uh, letters to his friends and colleagues saying, "This this can't go on. We we will lose the war, and it, even if we were to win the war, we, we we can't survive. There's no way to survive. We need a government like the one in England, and uh, by which he means one that that has the power to tax, that has the power to raise armies, that has the power to to uh, conduct, uh, to 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 um, negotiate treaties with foreign powers, and then impose those treaties on the citizens of the country. So, you know, uh, uh, an American like Jefferson or, or or someone like Payne looks at what Washington is saying, as, and and they say, "Look, you, you you're just as bad as as as, as the English. You you you, you want uh, a monarchy? Of course, it, you know it it wasn't quite a monarchy, but." The accusation is basically correct, that the Federalist Party looks to England and says explicitly, we need something, we need something like what the English have. And so from that perspective, uh, the, uh, the, American con the second American con Constitution of 1787 is a restoration. It's a restoration at the national level of the main, the main strokes 
of the traditional English constitution. Now, we're currently in the 18th century, and I think I'm going to move us forward a little bit just to help you us along. Uh, let's at least get into the 20th century. Okay. So you talk about, I think there are three key dates which I find interesting that you talk about in your book. The first is 1945, the second is 1989, and the third is 2020. So in 1945, I, I, I think you, you basically describe this as a time when conservatism is kind of losing its power, and this is the rise of the liberal age that you've described. 1989, obviously, the end of history, that sort of 20-year period of globalism and, 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 and liberalism you know, flourishing, mm -hmm. and 2020, finally, the <coughs> death of that liberal age. So let's talk about 1945. Why did the Conservatives lose that ideological battle after the Second World War? You know, it's, it, it, it's a very good question. I'm not even sure that, that how, hard, how hard they were fighting. I, I, I mean, um, I, I, I think probably the, 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 the best way to look at this is to say that the period of the two world wars, World War I and World War II and the period between them, end up inducing a, what I, I think we can reasonably call a trauma, a, 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 you know, a, a, a sense of despair about the old order, and uh, uh, in particular, um, you know, both, liberalists, uh, both liberals and Marxists come out saying nationalism, the, 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 the world of independent nation states, you know, each one with its own religion, each one with its own philosophy, there, there is a, um, a very large-scale retreat from or, or, or critique, which uh, in, in the book I bring a, uh, a lengthy passage from uh, an American Supreme Court decision in 1947, uh, the, the Ever Everson decision, which is the first time in American history that the United States Supreme Court recognizes separation of church and state as, a, uh, as a, a, a principle inherent in the American Constitution. Be, before that, it was you know, something that Jefferson believed in, but, but it wasn't something that Americans believed in. Uh, uh, American, American law repeatedly throughout, you know, up until the 1930s and onward, saw America as a Christian nation and recognized that explicitly as part of American law. And the um, 1947, right after World War II, is the first moment that you see a, an American Supreme Court that, that takes to itself the uh, responsibility and the authority to impose on all 48 states um, uh, a, uh, an, uh, a separation of church and state, which in fact involves the uprooting of the traditional constitutions of, you know, of, of most of the American states. Um, you know, so I'm not, I, I, I don't want to say that nothing good came out of it. I mean, I, I, I'm certainly very sympathetic to the, the, uh, um, to, to the, the, the desire by uh, uh, American uh, jurists and political leaders to put an end to the persecution of blacks in the American South. I mean, you know, the, they just lost, you know, almost half a million men uh, fighting racism and the, the, the argument we, we shouldn't be persecuting blacks. That's an argument that makes sense to me, but, um, but this, this trauma um, creates a mindset in which they're not just trying to uh, put an end to racism against blacks and persecution. There's a, uh, a mindset of, we're going to solve all the world's problems. We, we, we simply, we can't trust any, any inherited traditions anymore. We, in effect, we need a new constitution. And that new constitution, it, it, it sounds an awful lot like Jefferson or, or like the French Revolution. It's what the Federalists and, and, uh, uh, and Burke were arguing against. It's, it, uh, it's a, uh, a, a new constitution which is based almost exclusively on rights, equality, and consent. The problem is that when you look at it that way, you, you understand that 1947 begins a cultural revolution, a rolling cultural revolution, which starts by you know, banning God and the Bible and prayer from all schools in the United States, and then proceeds one step after another to, to, um, uh, to, to impose new rights and new qualities. And the problem is that there is no known formula for how to stop it. 
You know, it just keep it keeps going. Eventually, liberalism itself collapses into into the, this this crazy woke neo Marxism, and and it keeps going. So th that's something that we, you know, if if we're interested in, in in knowing what kind of force can stop this, then we have to go back to conservatism, but because because liberalism is the problem here. The pro the, the the problem is you know n not that I mean many of these aspirations are noble. The problem is that liberalism um, when when you when you raise a generation of children two generations three you raise them saying look you don't need you don't need, you, you don't need inherit a, a, a traditional inheritance not politically not religiously not morally use your think for yourself I think for your think for yourself that sounds like a, a nice thing but when when you have two or three generations of children who've only been told think for yourself and have not been told about uh, the, the, the greatness of the, the inheritance that they've received or what you would need to do in order to propagate it into future, future generations, well, we see what happens. What happens is that those kids, they think for themselves. And many of them, that's fine, except that they don't come out liberals. The liberals thought that they would all come out liberals, but they don't. They, they, they come out Marxists. Some of them come out fascists. N nothing seems to be you know, more advantageous than anything else. They, they, it, it can go anywhere. And, and, and then you need to start start saying our, our ancestors knew something about inheritance and tradition and restoration that that we've lost and we need to bring back now. So let's talk about inheritance a little bit and tradition. So Tim Stanley, he's one of our columnists at the Telegraph. He reviewed your book and he made a couple of criticisms and he he made he was talking about the point of slavery and yeah. obviously you condemn slavery. You just did so. Yeah. But one could make the argument that it was traditional, it had a history, Southern, Southerners were conservatives, they were Christian, um, they believed right. in the Constitution. So how does, one, how does one make a moral judgment on slavery when it, goes back, it has that tradition and it has that sort of empirical value and the, the people who are um, enacting slavery come from that conservative tradition with you know, who are so religious and everything else. And, you know, towards the end of the book, you talk about how to be a conservative, and yep. you could probably apply many of your principles to those southern slave owners and plantation right. owners. Yeah. Well, look, uh, there is there is an argument that you hear from, uh, from Leo Strauss and from others. Um, the, the argument is that conservatism, re conservatism really just is relativism. And th the reason for this is, is Strauss says, well, look, if everybody has different traditions, then that means that no tradition is better than another. And, and you know, George Washington, his, you know, he becomes president, his Thanksgiving address, he, uh, unlike Napoleon, George Washington says that the Americans wish all governments in the world well. And it's very, it's very striking that you know, America doesn't, isn't exporting revolution to all these other countries. We, we hope everyone does well. So um, Strauss and others, look at this and they say, you, you've completely taken morality out of, out of politics. The problem I have with this argument is that it, it's almost always being made by people who are not, that are, are not familiar with the common lawyers. They're not really familiar with Burke. I mean, it, 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 it's kind of astonishing. Um, Burke, like all of his predecessors uh, in, in English conservatism, in British conservatism, Burke believed that there that there is nature. There is such a thing as human nature. There are things th things that are better and things that are worse by nature. And um, so and that so just sorry just to draw you on that point sure. by nature. So does that mean universalist? In other words, it can apply to any human being around the world, no matter where they are. Well, look, he, he, here's the here's the difficult part about about conservative thought. And and by the way, th this goes back all the way back to the Hebrew Bible. It goes all the way back to the Bible, this issue, which is that, um, that you know, that uh, Moses is depicted as though, you know, he, he's, he's speaking to create the, the creator of heaven and earth. And, um, and he gets laws from crea the creator of heaven and earth. So why, 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 does it, why does ancient Israel, why does its God give borders? What are the borders for? Because you know, the, the, the Israelite God, the, it could have been the same as all the other gods in the Middle East that says, send the kings out, conquer the whole world, bring peace and prosperity, you, you re, eliminate all the borders. And our inheritance, our, our Jewish and Christian inheritance is one in which 
we have both in the same text over and over and over again. We have the same text, we, we have the, the, the same God who's on the one hand saying, look, here, here's a teaching that's going to help you fi find w what's right, what brings flourishing, what, what brings um, uh, uh, well-being to, to your nation. And on the other hand, is absolutely unequivocally saying that this imperialism of conquering the whole world, that it's evil, that, that it involves murder and, and stealing. And, and, and you're not, if you're going to be a, 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 a decent ruler of a decent kingdom, that's not what you're doing. You have, you have borders, and the people across the border, they, on the other side of the border, they have to find God their own way. So, so this, um, this Jewish ideal, which then becomes central to Christianity, is an ideal that, that says, well, people will look and they'll see that what we have is, you know, is something spectacularly important to the, and, and they'll imitate to, they'll come to us, we'll teach it to them. But the, the idea of conquering the other nations and imposing um, th these universal laws for, th that, that's already too far, that's, that's not biblical. And um, so this same argument is still going on today, is that Strauss looks at Burke and the, the common lawyers and the conservatives, and he sees only relativism. He sees, you know, he sees Fortescue, Fortescue saying, um, uh, look, the, uh, the, the laws of England are the best laws, but it may be that the French are not yet ready for these laws, or the, the, the Germans, and so it, it may be that, that there are places where if, um, if you, if you have the Roman law, which, which Fortescue says has this idea that the, 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 that the whim of the king is law, there may be times and places where, where you need that. So th then you come back to this, this relativism question. Now, I, I, in, in my book, I, I, I devote a, a, a quite extended discussion to getting into the details of understanding why conservatism is not, uh, is not relativism. Conservatism is much closer to, uh, to the kind of empiricism that's familiar to us from science. Um, the, the scientist, if he's been reasonably educated, does believe that there's a, a truth that he's pursuing. And, 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 and he does believe that Newton is an advance, that the Newtonian system is an advance. It, it, it brings you closer to the truth. It's an advance over the Aristotelian system. But at the same time, the, um, uh, the scientist is a skeptic. He both believes that there's this truth that he's trying to get at, or she, and at the same time says, you know, the things that we believe right now to be true, they, it may actually turn out that they're not true. It may turn out, as N Newton writes in the Principia, that, that, that when there's new evidence, it may either limit the extent of the laws that we found, or it may actually bring us to understand that we didn't understand the laws properly, and then we'll advance. So th this empiricism, um, I, I, I argue in the book, I'm, I'm far from the first person to make this argument, that, that it, it's not a coincidence that, um, that English science, you know, as opposed to French science, as opposed to you know, Cartesian science, that English science, uh, British science, is uh, empirical in nature. It believes that there's a truth, but it's constantly skeptical about whether what we have is good enough, maybe we can make it better. That's an inheritance of the common lawyers. Long before it was uh, applied to, uh, to physics and chemistry and, and biology, long before then, it was applied by the, the English jurists to discovering the law, trying to, f trying to discover how can, how can we make this better? I see there that, that it's, it's not functioning, that it looks unjust, that, that something is broken down. So, so how can we find the true law? That, that's that's the, the correct way of thinking about it, is that, that, that conservatives do believe, going all the way back to the Bible, that there, that, that, that there is a truth. But we're very skeptical about our ability you know, to know it right now. Let's go back to 1945, and I'm curious to know what your critique of this overwhelming liberal viewpoint was on conservatism and on nationalism. So 
you talk about the death camps, Auschwitz, what the Nazis did in the Second World War as being associated with the very things that you're discussing in your book, and hence there was this, you know, huge kind of revulsion against that yes. movement, against that. Why is that argument wrong, as it were? Why should we not treat uh, national conservatism in the same way, as uh, sort of having the outcome as uh, as the Nazis and the death camps and lit and you know hell? Well, look, th there's there's a couple of important things to say there. What, first of all, um, I. I don't want to learn political theory from Hitler. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a sure way of becoming very confused, and you might also end up being very evil. And the, um, uh, the, the fact that Hitler used the word nationalism, and, and, and he did, if you read Mein Kampf, I'm not recommending it, but if you read it, then you'll see that what Hitler means by nationalism is a biological imperialism. He, I mean, he's literally explicitly saying that, that the, German, the German people needs to become um, lord of the earth and mistress of the globe. Those, those are quotes. Uh, the, 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 he, for, for Hitler, the idea of independent nations, you know, j just like for, for you know, the, 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 uh, the pagan imperialists of antiquity, there are no borders for Hitler. There's only a question of how far your power can take you uh, uh, until you prepare for the, nec for, for the next round. And for the, the, the whole idea of an independent nation state, of nationalism, of a world of independent nations, he writes about it explicitly. He, he, he finds it completely contemptible. So w I, ca I kind of feel that, um, that after World War II, Marxists and uh, liberals um, Look, part, partly it's people, you know, honestly hearing Hitler talk about nationalism and saying, look, that, that, that's terrible. But partly I, I also think that this is, um, uh, that Marxists and liberals were using um, the, the fact that Hit, Hitler mis, uh, um, uh, mi misdefined nationalism. What was Hitler doing? He was taking an older idea the term nationalism had already existed. There are always all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, w w well-known uh, 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 liberals and conservatives and progressives who who were nationalists. Um, so you know uh, Moses Hess or Mazzini or Theodore Herzl or 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 um, prob probably the best definition definitions of how nationalism is supposed to work in the 19th century. They probably come from John Stuart Mill. So um, Hitler takes uh, the, the term nationalism that's associated with, uh, uh, you know, with all sorts of people who are worried about ending, ending the oppression of peoples under, uh, suffering under imperial rule or under uh, dictatorial rule, and he takes that and he says, okay, well, I'm going to use the word differently. So look, so I already said, I, I'm not interested in, in, in learning political theory from Hitler, but we, we do have an actual problem, which is that um, today there are many academics who are on the side of, of the globalists. They're on, what they want to see is, uh, is for the, bo the borders to fall and, uh, and you know, something like the World Economic For Forum is going to, uh, is going to be char in charge of governance and, and governments will kind of wither away or, or, or deal only with, with very small things. There, there are many professors who, who believe they, they, they want to see movement, progress towards that world. And um, when, when uh, someone comes and says, look, you're basically re recreating worldwide imperialism. You, you know that there's, no demo there's never in history been a democratic empire. There's no such thing. Empires are always you know, a, a, a nation or two nations, which then impose their will by, by brutal force on all the rest of the nations, the dozens that they can conquer. And so the, 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 the globalists are simply, I mean, they're returning to that same idea. And then you say, look, you, you're a liberal internationalist. I, I'm a, a nationalist conservative. And they say, no, 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 you can't say you're a nationalist because that makes you Hitler. I, th this is just too convenient for them, that there's no word that I'm allowed to use to describe the political theory that I, I, I think would do best for my people and for yours. 
there's so many things I want to talk about, but just just before we get onto the final part of your book, which is the most important, I would say, um, I have one more question, and and it's important to 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 also point out that there's two recent examples of them imposing this kind of liberalism, this liberal worldview on two countries, so Afghanistan and Iraq. They're nation building projects, yeah. and one can can sort of look up and see how how they worked out there. Um, but just very quickly, it's, there's an irony, isn't there, because it wasn't just the revulsion against fascism and Nazism that damaged conservatism as a movement after the Second World War, but also there was a revulsion against communism and the Soviet Union as being our ideological enemy. And you argue in your book that that's, this also did not help conservatives after the Second World War, particularly with this idea of fusionism. Yes. So can you give people just a quick idea of, of, of what happened there? Sure. Um, after, the, after the Second World War, there, there is, um, for, for, for some of the reasons we've discussed and for other reasons, the conservatives are routed. And there, there is a, a, an, a move by all sorts of um, intellectuals, historians, political theorists, philosophers, to, uh, to argue in America that America has never had any conservatism. That it, you know, it's been liberalism since it was founded. By the way, at the same moment, the same thing is happening in France and in in Britain and in Germany, where the the historians and intellectuals are arguing that, you know, actually there, you know, since since the Glorious Revolution, um, you know, we've been liberals, which I I I think is completely ahistorical, but but it is the way that people are taught to think about it. And in France, the same thing. The French Revolution, well, we, we all became liberals because of the ideals of the French Revolution. The, 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 the fact that, that millions were slaughtered in the name of this is, is not even mentioned. So, um, I, I, so, so the, there, there is this attempt to say that only li liberalism is legitimate. Now, I don't think that, that that's a, a reasonable reading of history. But it was reasonable to say, um, look, uh, the, the Soviets are advancing, communism is advancing, China just fell to, to, to communism. There's a, a communism is growing stronger also domestically within, within the democratic countries. And, uh, and the um, be beginning in the mid-1950s, there's an attempt to um, to construct uh, a, an alliance of conservatives and liberals, I should say conservatives and anti-Marxist liberals, anti-communist liberals. And that alliance was uh, pitted against you know, uh, both the threat of communism overseas and the, the rising threat of communism and socialism at home. That movement took the name of conservatism. And in the book, I argue. I mean, the, 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 there are some reasons for 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 saying that that would, you know, that, that wasn't a you know a stupid or misguided thing to do. It at at, at the time there, were, there there were some reasons to do it. The problem is that 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 alliance. The, you, you use the word fusionism. Fusionism c comes from William Bu William L. F. Buckley's circle, and uh, and particularly for Frank Meyer, the the the, the architects of this alliance of conservatives and anti-Marxist liberals. Um, they used the word fusionism, and their claim was that they had created a fusion between conservatism and liberalism. Um, the fusion, just to, to oversimplify, but roughly the fusion was this. Um, in our public life, we'll be liberals. Uh, the, the political life in, you know, in, in, in the public sphere is going to be based on uh, individual liberties, equalities, consent. In our private lives, we'll be conservatives. That's where we will be uh, uh, religious, will uh, and 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 and, uh, uh, and and care for our national inheritance, and we'll pass it down to our children. That look, there's two things to say about it. One, fusionism was incredibly successful. It it ended up with certain modifications, uh, putting Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in office, and. And they were, in fact, the people who defeated the Soviet Union. The, the intellectual tools that they got from fusionism 
were in fact um, uh, capable of defeating communism and it rolled, rolled back socialism for a generation. The other thing to say about it is that this fusion completely demolished conservatism. Uh, it, I, I mean, as soon as the Berlin Wall falls, it's 1989 or 1990, Mar Margaret Thatcher is kind of the, like the, the last nationalist. She, she, she leaves the stage and then all of a sudden everybody uh, wants, you know, universal world liberal uh, governance. And how did that happen? I mean, I was there. I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, sorry, I think. I, 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 I was there when we, were, when, when we were students and we were, you know, part of the, the, the Reagan-Thatcher movement and we were fighting, you know, we, we knew the enemy was communism. We all thought that, that nationalism and, and especially religion were an integral part of conservatism. Uh, Irving Kristol, I quote him in my book, but he, he was the most prominent in the United States, the uh, conservative thinker at the time. And, and he says explicitly over and over again that, that uh, conservatism has three pillars, religion, nationalism, and, and economic growth. And of those, he says religion is the most important because, because the uh, religion and nationalism are, are, are what keep the, uh, uh, the free market in, in bounds so it doesn't overstep its, its, its proper function. And, um, and so it's 1990. And Reagan is gone and Thatcher is gone. And all of a sudden we have, we have, we have you know, everybody's talking about new world order. And what, what happens at that moment is, is, is that, that uh, people who are still um, traditional conservatives or at least support something like that get swept aside. And nationalism and religion cease to be part of conservatism. And now conservatism is just liberalism which is incredibly confusing, but it's also incredibly damaging B because, because any young person who thinks, well, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative type of person. I'm the kind of person who cares about, uh, uh, about inheriting and, and, and passing on uh, the, the, the best things to future generations. I care about restoration. That kind of person, when, when he or she starts, you know, um, reading what the conservatives are saying, and there's nothing there but liberalism. So, I mean, there's two choices. Like, y y you, can, you can say, uh, well, I guess, I'm, I guess I am a liberal, because conservatism just is liberalism. Another choice is you can say, wow, I'm not a liberal. And, and, and then you start, you know, reaching for, you know, for, for fascism and wokeism, and it, it, it's amazingly destructive. And the only, <laughs> the, 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 the only reasonable Path. I don't know whether we'll do it or not, but this is this is what we what we have to do, is to be actual conservatives and to uh, seek a restoration. Um, you know, which doesn't mean we stop caring about in individual liberties, but but you know, a, as the conservatives, you know, e knew even in the 1960s, without nationalism and religion, there's no there's no future. Let's talk about that. So I've read, a rel I'm not going to say loads, but I've read a lot of conservative books by conservative authors and uh, you know contemporary authors and, and a lot of them are very depressing and they talk about the cultural revolution and uh, it, you know there's a term for this doomerism uh, yeah. you know and you can get quite unhappy reading these books but by the end of reading your book I wasn't necessarily unhappy uh, I think there's an optimistic tone it gives you a sort of call to arms a call to action it gives you a, a, a path on a personal level as to how to achieve a conservative life and you argue that this is the way to defeat these woke ideologies or even kind of liberalism in a way is to start it all starts at home yeah. can you describe how to be a conservative briefly sure um, look I, I I know and love many many young conservatives um, who pour their time and their intellectual energies and their activism into, um, into all sorts of causes. Many of them are, you know, I, 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 I agree with, you know, pe 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 people who uh, w want, a, uh, um, uh, want to restore the, 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 the traditional family or to, um, to uh, bring independence and strength to, to the nation state and all sorts of other things. But at home, they live like liberals. You know, they, they, 
th they talk like conservatives because they've, you know, they've heard all sorts of conservative things. They, they pull them together and, and they say, okay, now I'm a conservative. But the problem is that um, what we learned from fusionism, if, 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 if we didn't understand it before, is that you, you can't actually maintain um, a public conservatism and a private liberalism, or a pro public liberalism and a private conservatism, it 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 doesn't work because a, a you know I, I said at the beginning that uh, a conservative view sees uh, mankind naturally as forming into families and tribes and nations, and the um, this natural hierarchical ordering. If if you don't if you're not a part of it then you can't inherit anything. I, I mean, I, I, in the book, I, go, I, I, I describe you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the way that this works in some detail, but to make it really simple, um, traditional societies, conservative societies, are, they're, they're built around honor, giving honor, um, you know, like in the 10th in the commandment, honor your father and your mother. And um, honoring your parents is then, you know, there's honoring your teachers, there's honoring your elders, there's honoring your ancestors, there's honoring you know, the, the, the clergy, there's honoring religion, there's, I mean, the, 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 the whole of a conservative life is one in which um, the, the young people do not declare themselves to be, you know, fully rational beings and independent at the age of 18 or 20 when they go off to college, and, 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 and from then on they're free. In a conservative society, you, you're never free from, I mean, you're born into a family. You don't choose your parents. These are unchosen obligations. You have an obligation to honor your parents. And, and it doesn't get easier. You know, it gets harder in life. Like you're an adult, you still have to honor your parents. Your parents, they, they start getting weak, they start getting sick, someone needs to take care of them. So, you know, so we have a wonderful solution. We, we, you know, we, we take all the old people, we dump them in a, uh, in a nursing home and we pay somebody to take care of them. But th this, th this, is, this is a liberal life where you're, I don't know, 35 years old, you're living with a woman, um, you, you don't know when you're gonna get married, you're scared to get married because everybody's getting divorced. Um, you, you talk to your parents, you know, once a month on the phone, but you don't, you're, you're not around, you live at the other side of the country from them, you don't, you, you don't see them, you don't belong to any congregation. There's no Sabbath in which you can plug into the traditions and, and try to work on yourself to understand the things you don't understand. You go to the beach on the Sabbath, or, or, you, or maybe just work seven days a week. I, lots of people I know do that now. And, and this liberal life, <laughs> It, it just makes people incredibly unhappy. Now, there may be individuals who can get through their whole lives and be happy with it, but look at what's happening. Uh, uh, young people, a young man and a young woman, they want to get married. They're scared to get married. Why are they scared to get married? Because they look around, they see that everybody's getting divorced. And why is everybody getting divorced? Because, because maintaining a marriage is a traditional skill, and they've never seen it done. They, they haven't inherited it. They, they don't know what you would actually need to do in order for your, your, your marriage to last for 50 or 60 years. You, you don't know what you actually need to do to raise children who honor their parents. All of these things have just simply been wiped out and they don't have examples of it. Now, th that, that sounds a little bit depressing, but the, the good part is that if you make the decision, the, the, the reason that I, I, I feel I can talk about this is because my wife and I, when we were in college, we came from these kinds of broken families where, where you know, we had very, very distant examples. Um, it, our own families were not traditional families. Our own families were liberal families with all, with, with all, all the, 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 the destruction and, and, and uh, hardship. But um, we decided when we were in college that we were going to find the tradition. Um, we we uh, went to live with my aunt and uncle who were Orthodox Jews uh, living in Israel. We learned from them. Then we, we, went, we came back to college. We joined the, uh, the, the Orthodox Jewish community. And um, if your attitude is, well, I'm equal to all these people, you know, my reason is just as good as theirs, then you can't learn anything and you're never going to get anywhere. You'll never have a conservative life. But if you're willing to humble, humble yourself just a little bit and say, you know what, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to elevate them, to honor this community, this congregation, the, 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 these elders. I'm going to try to honor them and see what happens. So I'll tell you what happens. Is as soon as you, st as you start honoring somebody who knows more than you do or, or, or 
uh, is attached to the tradition or lives a traditional life, as soon as you start honoring them and saying, wow, you know, they know things I don't know, then your mind opens up and you start being able to learn. You start being able to become a part of the tradition, which, which you've completely lost at the moment that you left home and said, well, that's it, I'm, I'm a rational being, I can do math problems. And um, this is, look, so, so on, on the one hand, um, there's a very personal aspect to this. Do you want to, you know, do you actually want to lead a decent life? If you, if, if you want to be able to do things like keeping a marriage together, you, you have no choice. You have to join a living tradition, a community in which the traditions are still alive, where, where a life of conservation is, of, and transmission is still happening, and you have, to, you have to imitate it. You can't learn this from books. A whole library of books on conservatism isn't going to help you if you're not joining an actual conservative community and, and seeing and, and learning, like, from actual living people, what, what it is that you need to do. So just a few questions on, on, on that. If I wanted to live a conservative life, could I become a Muslim and do that? Would, would you recommend that? Well, you, look, you, you could. Um, what I recommend is the, the path that I think is the path of least resistance, which is um, you begin with the tradition of your family, if not your parents, then your grandparents, if not your grandparents, then your aunts and uncles. You begin with something that is intuitively and instinctively yours. So, you know, you feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm distant from that, I've fallen away, but when, when you start going to your aunt and uncle's congregation, to their Orthodox congregation, it, it's very quickly, it becomes yours. You realize that it's yours, and, and it, it starts awakening. Now, I understand there are plenty of people who, um, who are not going to be happy with, uh, with, you know, with the Christianity that they grew up with, and they'll, they'll want to look for something else. My, my wife is actually a convert to Judaism, and you know, the, the, there are many people who convert to a different religion because for whatever reason they think that the, uh, that the path from their own family is blocked. But the first place to start, the natural place, is to look for God in your own tradition. Can you be an atheist and a conservative? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes and no. Yes, you can be an atheist who decides, I'm going to give honor to the religious tradition. I don't understand it yet, but I'm going to give honor to it and I'm going to try to make sense of it. That kind of an atheist can be a conservative, somebody who's trying to restore the traditions in his or her, or her own life. Um, if you're an atheist of the kind who says, look, I, I'm just smarter than all my ancestors. They were primitives, they had these stupid ideas, and you know, I can't learn anything from them, they should learn from me. Then, then you can't be a conservative. Then you, you're, you're gonna be a liberal or a Marxist or something, you're, you'll never be a conservative. Now I've interviewed in my previous role, Richard Dawkins, and yeah. I was admittedly a huge fan of Mr. Dawkins when I was growing up. Right. Atheist parents, atheist household, as I said, absolutely loved Mr. Dawkins. And as I started to read more and expand my knowledge beyond my family and beyond what my teachers had taught me, I began to be more critical of Mr. Dawkins and, and his beliefs. Um, and I interviewed him and, 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 you know, we had a discussion about the utility of religion and he didn't want to speak about the utility of religion. Yes. That really wasn't uh, what he wanted to speak about. And I think that you speak a lot about the utility of religion in your books and you speak a lot about it in your interview. However, there is one thing I think maybe you miss out on and where Mr. Dawkins pr pr probably does better on and that is he talks about truth and he talks about science and he talks about all I care about is whether it is true or not, not yeah. about the utility of religion. And maybe there is something in this book about it, I can't remember reading it, about whether God is true in itself right. and whether, it's, whether God is real and whether yes. you should believe because it is true and because it is scientifically true. So can you just comment on, on let's ignore the sure. utility for a moment and let's look at whether this is, this is true or not. Okay, so for, first of all, um, chapters three and four um, which are, I admit are very, are, are, very, are very long chapters, but if you, uh, if you focus on chapters three and four, then uh, y you will find arguments for w why 
A, we should believe, we should search for the truth. Searching for the truth is, in fact, crucial. B, um, why um, God and Scripture are essential in the search for truth. Why, why, I, why I, as a, a, uh, uh, a religious Jewish person, don't think it's possible. I, 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 I think it's simply not possible to have a coherent, workable, conservative uh, worldview that, that doesn't have God in Scripture in it, and I, I discuss that in some, uh, in some detail. Um, but, um, but why does that mean God is real? Do you see what I mean? I, I, I totally accept that. But the, the point about God, you know, proving God's existence, as it were, you know, that's, that's well, something that people think about. They, yeah, yeah I, look, I, um, first of all, I, I, I also en I enjoy reading Dawkins. I've never met him, but I, 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 w I think I would enjoy talking to him. But um, uh, I enjoy reading him. The, his arguments are very clear. They're very sharp. They're su superbly written. And, um, and there's a lot of truth in what he says. I mean, the, the, um, his criticism of the proofs of God, uh, God's existence, I, m most of that criticism I, I actually agree with. And uh, so <laughs> what I don't agree with is that you know at, at various points, Dawkins and also Sam Harris, um, at various points in their books, they start to say, "Look, I'm only going to argue with people who believe in the proofs of God's existence because I decide that that's the only way that you can get to truth." And so they end up in a uh, in an argument with uh, with a <coughs> with a a very specific. Um, medieval tradition of what God is and how you get to him. And then when, when, when you, know, they, you know, somebody says to them in an audience or something, but look, that very specific medieval tradition about you know, proving God's existence, it, that, that's not what's in the Bible. That's not what's in the rabbinic tradition. It's very different from you know, what's, what's, what's in the, you know, the early church. And you know what? Also, even even modern philosophy, modern religious thinkers are are not necessarily uh, um, uh, always uh, people who who find the medieval arguments for proving God compelling. And so you come and you say to them, "Look, um, Richard, Sam, um, here I am. I, I'm I'm an Orthodox Jew. I'm not just a practicing Jew. I'm a believing Jew. I believe in God." Let's talk about how the prophets approached seeing God in the world, seeing God's hand in history, seeing God's God's feeling God's breath within within the world, and then they immediately say, "No, no, 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 that's not authentic Judaism." He's telling me it's not authentic Judaism or, or Christianity. I, look, honestly, I, I think I think that they're pretty ignorant about Christianity and Judaism. What what, what they're doing is they are they are picking out a particular tradition and I don't believe in that tradition. I think that tradition is mistaken. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll agree with many of Dawkins' arguments. But what I want to hear from him is, okay, so, 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 so tell me about, you know, how, there are no proofs of God's existence in the, in, in the Hebrew Bible or in the rabbinic tradition. So how, how do you know that you're approaching the truth of God. How, how do you see God? How do you how do you relate to it? So I, you know, I have answers to that. I, 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 I've written written books. I've written articles. I, I have a lot to say on the subject. But the main thing I have to say on the subject is is that that it's dishonest for um, Dawkins and Harris and and their friends to uh, beat up on a particular tradition that they think that they can defeat. And I actually think that they can defeat it as well, but they're not willing to listen to anybody else. They'll say, oh no, you know, the, those are not authentic religious beliefs. And I, I think the opposite. I think that they can't understand the Bible because th they open it and, and none of those proofs are there. So, so what's going on in the Bible? The Bible is supposed to be God's word. It's supposed to be the word of the prophets you know, that, that entered the world. So why are, why are they unwilling to talk about the God of scripture? Very strange. Thank you so much, Yoram, for joining us. I appreciate it. My pleasure.